who experiences your life? That might strike you as an odd question. Most of us would generally agree that a person's consciousness, the experiencer and willer of their lives, is enabled by that person's unique soul. This idea frames our understanding of reality with the belief that each of us is fundamentally separate from the rest of the world, with the rest of existence out there and ourselves in here looking out on the world. This is and seemingly always has been the default belief for humans, as evidenced by its prevalence in every aspect of most human cultures, in our fictions, social conventions, moral beliefs, etc. We take it to be the defining feature of selfhood that the experiencer and willer of every self is that self's unique soul. Because of this, it can be difficult, and for some even a bit frightening, to question this idea. To call someone soulless can be the most sincere dismissal of their character, marking them as irredeemably evil or even less than human. We also tend to love the idea of having a soul, mainly because it would seem to allow for an afterlife, along with all the justice and reconciliation that might bring to our confused world. Aside from the conventional cultural beliefs surrounding this topic, what reasons do we really have to believe in this thing we call the soul? Historically, it is clear that the soul hypothesis was developed to account for what appeared to be a totally inexplicable, perhaps even supernatural phenomenon, human consciousness comprising thought, experience, will, and action. Throughout the vast majority of our species' time here, we had absolutely no explanation as to how such a phenomenon could come to exist, nor, for example, why it ceases in sleep. Of course, it is worthwhile to note that we also had no explanation for the shining of the sun, nor the blueness of the sky, nor the growth of plants, nor most any other natural phenomenon. In every case, the various human cultures developed myths as a way of fabricating an understanding of the mysterious world they found themselves in. Giving a phenomenon a name and an origin story, however fanciful or divorced from reality, helped soothe our natural yearning for things to make sense. Over time, as our knowledge of the world grew, we began to discover explanations for some of the old mysteries that didn't need a supernatural element at all, and so the mythical aspect to our understanding of those things fell away. Even with scientific revolutions of all kinds, many phenomena went unexplained for centuries, and these retained their mythical explanations. Some phenomena are still mostly inexplicable to us, one being the phenomenon of consciousness, as evidenced by the supernatural explanation, the soul, still attached to it. Might this supernatural explanation also fall away as our knowledge continues to grow? Modern neuroscience has uncovered a wealth of facts pertaining to the operation of the brain and the links brain activity has to consciousness. Neuroscientific evidence suggests that specific conscious states are always correlated with specific brain states. Using fMRI imaging and similar techniques, scientists can observe specific neural structures being activated in response to specific stimuli. For example, when a subject is looking at a dog, a predictable pattern of neural activity arises in that subject's brain specific to seeing dogs and which differs from that subject's neural activity when looking at any other type of stimulus. It has also been shown that stimulating neural activity using electrodes can produce marked conscious effects in the subject, from feelings of pleasure and excitement to states of dread or terror. Further, states of unconsciousness correlate with specific patterns of brain activity, as do states involving dreaming. These facts seem to indicate that conscious experience is the product of neural activity, specifically those neural activities which correlate with conscious functions or sensations. The fascinating question of how this phenomenon in turn influences the behavior of neurons in the form of conscious will influencing brain activity must be set aside for the moment. But, if consciousness in general is the result of neural activity, what consequence must this have for our understanding of the nature of selfhood, the nature of personal consciousness? It seems to suggest that just as a gravitational field will arise wherever matter coalesces anywhere in the universe, and just as a magnetic field will swirl around any electron accelerating anywhere in the universe, the phenomenon of conscious experience will occur anywhere in the universe that physical interactions of the type seen in brains occur. Consciousness, therefore, must be a fundamental phenomenon in the universe, just as fundamental as gravitation and electromagnetism, such that anywhere brains physically undergo the correct type of neural activity, their consciousness arises. And just as the sun's own gravitational field is but one instance of a universal phenomenon, and not an expression of the sun's unique soul or anything like that, and just as the generators creating the electricity running your computer harness the universal electromagnetic field present throughout space, your brain, through its physical nature, harnesses the phenomenon of consciousness. It is not the case that an indestructible, bodiless, subjective soul alighted on your brain and powered it up for this lifetime, granting you consciousness. Rather, your brain engages the universal potential for consciousness to arise when information is processed in a certain way. 
Okay, to clarify, suppose that it will be possible in the future to create synthetic brains which can successfully perform all the activities of healthy human brains. While this feat is light years beyond our current capabilities, it is clear that it is not impossible in principle. There are no laws of physics which forbid putting elements together in such a way as to create a brain. Indeed, biological evolution has already accomplished this miracle of engineering. If future scientists could scan your brain in its entirety, including all its connections and chemical conditions, and then replicate that configuration of matter in the laboratory, providing it with a requisite diet of oxygen and energy, along with sensory feeds analogous to sight, sound, taste, touch, etc., would it be you who experiences that replica brain activity? Surely it would not, because your brain is not connected to this replica brain in any direct way, no more than your brain is connected to my brain. You and your normal body over here will not feel the conscious activity in that replica brain over there, no matter how closely it mimics your real brain. Now suppose an evil scientist takes your replica brain and feeds it sensory data gathered from subjects undergoing physical torture, perhaps being stretched on a rack. In the replica brain, the same neural patterns arise which would be observed in a person who is actually experiencing the agony of that situation, and it appears that consciousness of that experience is the necessary consequence of these neural patterns. Who in this case is experiencing that pain? It seems that the only answer is that consciousness itself is the one who's experiencing that pain. In fact, it seems that the only real answer to any question of the form, who is experiencing X, is capital C, consciousness. For example, to answer who's experiencing, say, Jerry Seinfeld's life with, well, Jerry Seinfeld is, would be fundamentally incorrect. Jerry Seinfeld comprises everything unique about his neural makeup, physical embodiment, and history, but the one who actually experiences this unique position is not characterized by its Jerry Seinfeldness, but by its experiential consciousness. Who's experiencing my life? Consciousness. Who's experiencing your life? Consciousness. The only difference is in the lens through which consciousness comes to have experience, our unique brains. Fundamentally, the same universal entity experiences both of our lives, and all lives. If this is actually true, it would have an enormous significance for our understanding of life and reality. It would mean that rather than each having our own private soul forever apart from the rest of the universe, instead we each share in the one soul the fundamental experience of consciousness. What use would there be for jealousy in this context? Your pleasure is felt in the exact same being as mine, just from a different perspective. What use would there be for cruelty or revenge? Your agonies are endured in the same experiential fabric as mine, just within a different shell, a superficially separate me. While I don't feel your pain in my body, the one entity which does any feeling at all feels your pain, and my experiences are shared in that one entity. Indeed, in hurting any self, I am hurting myself, because we all share the same self, the same experiencer, consciousness. What would this tell us about life and death? If, rather than being a soul forever bound to a personal subjectivity, eternally apart from all others, my life is instead just one drop in the vast experiential ocean of consciousness, and the same is true of you and everyone else, what does it mean to die? It appears that the death of a human is the end of that unique window into reality through which consciousness perceives that singular life. But in fact, every single life is a portal into that self-same phenomenon, consciousness. This suggests that, fundamentally, we are not our bodies, nor our personalities, nor our character. These are simply the conditions within which consciousness currently experiences and participates in life. This universal phenomenon of experientiality is home to every experience, every life. If this is true, then the level of tragedy we ascribe to death might be unjustified. Of course, I'm not suggesting that losing a loved one is not an unspeakably painful experience, but that we do the dead an injustice if, on top of feeling sorry ourselves for our loss, we also feel bad for their soul, as if their subjectivity were still out there, without their body but forever experiencing their unique selfhood. This is an incredibly heartbreaking thought, that not only are we here missing them, they are still out there somewhere missing us, probably missing life. Most of us have framed our understanding of death in some form of this context, and I think this is a big reason that death can seem like such a cruel and pointless fate, and why we can feel so sorry for the dead. If it is true that consciousness is a universal phenomenon, and not something unique to each of our souls, this fact would clearly have enormous implications for humanity, far beyond my ability to analyze or convey. I feel compelled, nonetheless, to assert that when facts arise which challenge our traditional beliefs, we must not shy away from examining them. Since we are part of the universe, a clearer understanding of the universe must afford us a clearer understanding of ourselves. 
I'm not sure how you feel about this idea, but from thinking about it for a long time, I find that reality looks very beautiful through this lens. The golden rule becomes an obligation. Treat others the way you would have them treat you, because they are you. We are all part of one me, that of the one universal experiencer. Life is not me versus the world, with eternity riding on the outcome. It's just a fleeting adventure through this miraculous universe. That life and consciousness are possible at all? God, that's amazing. Thank you.